The current Ebola outbreak is the worst and the most disastrous in the history of Ebola outbreaks. It all started from a two-year-old boy in the southern eastern village in Guinea. But from there, Ebola spread through Guinea and from Guinea to the neighboring West African countries to the different parts of the world shutting down economies, threatening national securities, spreading fear and panic all over the world. And the world responded. Help came from West Africa, from America, from Europe, from China, and from the rest of the world. Then later in the response, the African Union decided and reached out to um, African governments, the 54 African governments, that, hey, this is an African problem and it requires an African solution. So in the spirit of Pan-Africanism, the African government responded by deploying human material and financial resources to help curtail the heartbreak. So the Nigerian government, after successfully curbing its own Ebola outbreak, decided to deploy some of our health experts to the affected West African countries to help. So I was invited to um, volunteer for the Ebola outbreak. When I was invited to um, volunteer, it was a very hard decision for me to make because I found myself in a dilemma. I'm a humanitarian, and I've done a lot of charity works, and I believe I know that um, <coughs> helping people in their need was the right thing to do. I was sure about that. But Ebola was a very deadly, it's a deadly disease, highly infectious, and it has no cure. And here is an invitation for me to go to the very hot spot of the infection at the peak of the heartbreak. So it was a very difficult decision for me. But along the line, I found peace from within. I decided that I was not going to be captured by fear. I decided to go. When I made the decision to volunteer for the outbreak, it was an unpopular decision because of the fear of stigmatization, because of how dangerous it is. So I couldn't tell my friends. I couldn't even tell my colleagues. And even my family allowed me to go after a lot of reassurance and um, perseverance. When I was leaving Lagos, the Murita Light Mohammed International Airport for the trip to um, Sierra Leone. I did not know what to expect. There was a mixture of fear, a mixture of uncertainty, a mixture of not knowing what to expect. And when I got to the Lungi Airport in Sierra Leone, I was shocked to see the airport deserted with only few UN airplanes dotting the runways with men in military uniform in a scenario that is very similar to that of a war zone. So it became clear to me that I was actually at the war front, but this time around to fight an unseen enemy. So after Settling down, I had some preliminary trainings, and I got to work. I was sent to the Magbente Treatment Center, which is operated by the African Union in conjunction with Sierra Leone Ministry of Health and Sanitation. 
Our treatment center started to operate in November 2014. But before then, we did a study of the treatment centers that were operating before us. We looked into their treatment protocols and their survival rates. And we discovered that the survival rates were very low. It was as if people were being brought, Ebola patients were being brought from their homes to the treatment centers just to die. So we, we thought within ourselves, why come all the way from the country and not going all the way in helping people? So we knew we had to develop a more robust, a more daring, a more effective treatment protocol so as to increase survival rates. Death during Ebola, Ebola patients die basically from the uh, hypovolemic shock that results from the massive fluid loss. So, and in normal medical practice, you don't replace that kind of loss, fluid loss, by drinking water or um, salt and sugar solution. The appropriate thing to do was to do intravenous administration of fluid. But treating an Ebola patient is dangerous enough, and you don't want to add any further risks to it. So we're caught between two dangers. It was another dilemma. But we did that very thing that was unthinkable in Ebola treatment, and that is to go invasive. So in our treatment protocol, we made sure that all admitted Ebola patients were cannulated and all had adequate intravenous rehydration, all had analgesics, prophylactic antibiotics, and antimalarials, and other hematinics. Because we also realized from our initial study that some of these patients die not only because of Ebola, but because of other underlying diseases and infections that nobody would touch them because of Ebola. So we had a comprehensive plan to take care of everything. And it paid off. It helped significantly. We admitted and treated a total of 157 patients and 101 patients survived, giving our treatment center an amazing 65% survival rate. But what we ensured, we made sure that everybody in the, we made sure that the IV team were made up of the healthcare workers that got infected during the outbreak that were now survivors. So we made sure that our IV team were former healthcare workers that are now survivors. And we also ensured that all the workers in the center we are abiding by the strict standard operating procedures of the center and the uh, infection prevention control measures of the treatment center, which was very effective because we had a 0% infection of over 200 healthcare workers of the um, treatment center. Now, what didn't work in Ebola treatment? What didn't work were treatment protocols where the Ebola patients were just given fluid to drink as the only or the bulk of their treatment plans because the patients were either too weak to drink or they would drink too little to um, replace lost fluid. Then, very importantly, one of the um, things, the highlight of my work at the center, each time I'm about entering into the red zone, into the high risk zone for my ward rounds, I almost always feel this increased awareness of fear that I'm stepping into real danger. But each time, I take solace in the African proverb that he that is new deep in the river doesn't complain of cold. And that has been helping me. So working in an Ebola treatment center 
was not without its own emotional trauma. Because as a doctor, you want your patients to get well. But despite all we did, some patients just did not come around. I remember one dear lady, she was in her early 20s. When I attended to her during my world rounds, she usually talked about her family, her children, and she was always worried. But I remember reassuring her that she was going to make it, she was going to survive. But sadly enough, she did not make it. It was very sad for me. But I also remember another young man. When we admitted him, he was very weak. To say the truth, none in my team had high hopes of him surviving. But we admitted him anyway. We gave him um, all in our treatment protocol. And after several days, he finally come ar came around and he survived. Was I frustrated during the um, mission? Yeah. You know, I was quite frustrated because having to live for a long time with a high sense of alertness, a high sense of suspicion was quite frustrating because each time your friend or your colleague had a fever or is feeling sick, you have to be careful, you have to be sure the person is not if infected. And um, the daily routine of taking temperature checks like five times a day, regular hand watching, was equally very distressing. And having to live for months without the basic forms of human relation, no handshake, no hug, no forms of physical contact, was equally um, distressing. But all through the mission, I was guided by the um, principle that don't try to be a hero. Just be a professional. Do the best that you have to do, that you can do, within the circumstances, without getting um, unduly emotionally attached. Though making the decision to volunteer and to work in a treatment center during the peak of the heartbreak and at the odd zone of the infection, making the decision to go was a very dangerous thing to do. But as I look back now, as the world approaches an Ebola free time, it turned out to be one of the best decisions I have ever made. Now, we, can, we realize that the world never expected that a small outbreak from a village in one part of the world would threaten the rest of the world. So the world never prepared for an health outbreak of this magnitude. And that is important for us because we need to start to prepare for the next health heartbreak. Respond, distress calls during the heartbreak, response to it was very um, slow, in some cases not well um, coordinated. So right now, will the world be better prepared for the next health outbreak? That's the question that we all need to ask ourselves. Thank you. And not only is Freeman a brave man, but he's also trying to go to space. In 12 seconds, tell us about how you're trying to go to space. OK. Um, Cougar Crown is doing a rising star program. And I'm one of the top three finalists from 30,000 applicants from more than 90 countries. And I need your help to be the overall finalist by sending, using this hashtag send Freeman to space from now till end of November. It is only a day trip. 
but we want Freeman, as a Wired Innovation Fellow, to be the first African in space. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.